welcome Dr. Tara Hammond. We invited her to uh, come and uh, speak to us uh, for a moment or two about um, her paper. Again, uh, Dr. Hammond, want to welcome you here. Um, can you give us a little background about why you chose to study this? And Sure, yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I, um, I chose this for a couple of different reasons. I do think it's a hot topic and certainly a topic of debate. I mean, if we follow the trend in human medicine, we can see that a lot of hemorrhagic shock models have seen successful resuscitation in military models just for potentially rebleeding, you know, potential extravasation of fluids into the lung or into the vasculature, I'm sorry, out of the vasculature into the interstitial space. Logistically, you can't often carry you know, that number of crystalloids in the field. So that sort of set the stage for it would be nice to investigate this in animals. Certainly, you know, 10, 20 years ago, we just knew 90 mils per kg. Here you go, two large gauge catheters, two liters, two pressure bags. And what we were starting to see is these animals are having significantly more blood loss. These animals wouldn't stabilize and were needing to be rushed into the OR. These animals were potentially requiring more transfusions or starting to get pulmonary edema and their survival rates weren't what they should be. And so we wanted to look into some type of alternative and certainly hypertonic saline and colloids are not benign, but unlike human medicine, we can't just jump to blood. You know, as you've already stated, some hospitals don't stock blood. I think more realistically, you know, in our hospital, we would not puncture a bag of blood on triage because a lot of these owners choose to euthanize once we talk about what's going on, the odds of hemangio, the odds, you know, the months of survival, and I think it's unfair to end up euthanizing a patient, adding a blood charge on. And so we were looking for an alternative, you know, what what could get a stability in a dog for maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes as we sort out, would you want to go forward? Here are the odds, here are the costs. Can we warm blood? Can we potentially swing you through ultrasound to see if there's mets everywhere? And that's what we found worked really well. You know, this study started with several hundred dogs, but because there's no severity of illness score in dogs, we wanted to choose a very specific patient population that we thought was comparable. And so we chose the one that presents to us most commonly and most emergently where you have to act fast and make a decision. So we purposely kicked out animals that weren't quote unquote shocky enough objectively, that weren't going to require blood, that had trauma or had a coagulopathy to get down to this very specific patient population. Um, certainly there's been a lot of questions and certainly colloids have gotten a lot of press in the recent you know months to years about their side effects and those are very real. But I think you're balancing, you know, these dogs are generally well hydrated, not azotemic, Short of the few that may be in DIC probably don't have clotting abnormalities when they start. You know, these dogs are healthy and their spleen ruptures. And you're probably going at a risk versus benefit. You're probably benefiting by resuscitating, by getting their intervascular volume restored, by getting the hemorrhage under control versus taking the risk of giving a colleague to say an azotemic or thermosetic tenic patient or some of those things that often come up. You know, this study was done with head of starch because it's a few years old and that's what we stocked in our hospital. Certainly doing it with something like vet starch may be a little bit safer. Um, you know, the other thing is in human medicine, they'll jump right to human serum albumin. We don't have the availability and cost effectiveness of canine albumin to be able to bolus like that. So we have to sort of, we have a different, um, we just have different resources, different constraints, different considerations, things like that. I think that, you know, comparing some of the college studies, they're comparing septic, azotemic, sick humans that have been on a ventilator in the ICU for six or eight weeks. That's a completely different beast as far as colloid risk of the healthy dog who suddenly is in hemorrhagic shock who might get a 10 or 20 mil bolus, stabilize, do great for a few days and, and go home and be totally fine. So those are the things that we were looking into. And anecdotally, we've probably done this in two or 300 more animals and had good success. And our study wasn't powered to look at this, but we're finding less cost to owners, less stays in the hospital, and less transfusion requirements. So that was sort of the big picture for me. 
That's uh, that's some great background uh, and background information and considerations, Dr. Holhan. Do you have any other comments? Yeah, Dr. Hammond, thank you so much for joining us and taking time out tonight. I actually had a, a question about, and I apologize if I'm just not picking it up in the article, but the article states that after the 30 minutes uh, or 30 minutes after achieving stabilization endpoints, four of the dogs became tachycardic again. Um, and then those dogs were treated with packed red blood cells, all yep. of which were in the conventional resuscitation group. And then yep. when you evaluate the table, <laughs> the mils per tig of packed red blood cells um, looks to be bigger or larger in the um, lower volume group. Can you yep. comment on that? Sure, sure. So the initial study, you know, because it was clinical on pets, you know, with consent, their safety took precedence. So if the primary clinician on my case decided to bowl with something else that wasn't what they got in the envelope, they got whatever they needed, they were dropped from the study. If they needed more fluid, they got whatever they needed. If they suddenly needed blood to stabilize, they were not included in our study. These needed to be dogs that needed fluids only to stabilize. And then they all they all ended up getting blood later, whether that was pre, peri, or post op. And so you'll see that the animals that stabilized and then started to need blood around that 30 minute mark, they were all in the limited, I'm sorry, all in the large fluid group, which sort of lends support to the crystalloids extravasating and leaving your intervascular space. You know, we have good evidence that maybe 10 or 20 percent are left circulating after an hour or so. Versus, you know, some people argue that the crystalloid colloid combination stays in your vessels for two to three hours. But overall, in mils per kg, when you crunch, the limited dogs got a little bit more per that chart. It's just in the timing. They didn't necessarily become clinical again on their way to surgery. They stabilized well, got staged, went to surgery, if that makes sense. So that was during the hospital stay, the total yeah. during hospital stay, or was that over? Okay, yep. that's okay. No, nope, that, that sense. was total. And of, yep. and it's broken down in the and text of course into. Yeah, it's broken down in the text into like pre-op, carry-op, and post-op, but the total mil per kg is complete hospital stay. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. I think that, too, with 18 dogs, it may be difficult to really extrapolate whether that was a, a true difference, which I know you comment about in your discussion and, and limitations. But I thought this was an, an excellent study and, and very well done. And um, I, from doing research studies in residency as well, can relate to how difficult it is to enroll patients when the clinicians are um, not really wanting to jump on board with your your treatment protocol, but I thought this was a good group of, of dogs to evaluate this, and I think definitely makes me consider it when we're looking at patients presenting to our hospital because we have the same thing. It takes us 20, 30 minutes to sit down with those clients, hit them hard with what's going on with their um, dog, and then ask them a very difficult question on whether or not they want to move forward, and so it is nice um, because we also have our own blood bank, but it's uh, a precious resource, and you don't want to crack that bag open um, and then have Absolutely. it be wasted when um, the patient may not be moving forward. Now, do you, you commented like 200 or more patients have used this protocol. Are you using this at your hospital now? Do you, do you tend yes. to um, gravitate towards it? Yes, unless there's some type of contraindication where maybe this animal was sick and dehydrated, you expect that they may mm -hmm. be supernatremic, dehydrated, that they've had a history, I don't know, say of vomiting, renal disease, heart disease, something that makes me sh shy away from it, but this is our go-to. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, you know, my pet was completely fine, no pre-existing diseases, no pre-existing presumable electrolyte abnormalities or proven pre-existing electrolyte abnormalities. This is our go-to.